Well, with all that said, how do you diagnose a relapse? I know we're going to talk in this program about a new algorithm, but let's start with first principles. You know, you said you speak to the people on the phone, you ask these questions. What are the next steps in actually distinguishing relapse from not, at least uh, the basics? So uh, again, if I need to, I'm going to get these folks in to see them for a, a clinical exam to see if I can find any physical changes that may or may not be present as a result of the relapse. So you're going to evaluate them. Um, but again, as I said, the key issue here is listening, listening to what they're telling you and how they're telling you things. Usually when we bring them in, we're going to have them ideally have urine, uh, urine specimen done before they ever come in so that we can rule out the urinary tract infection that they all deny that they have um, because they don't have burning or, or frequency or anything. That's just part of their normal MS. But in fact, when we look at it, we've probably got 70% of them with an underlying UTI. We get some of those things treated and amazingly they do better. So our big issue in terms of diagnosing MS is trying to tease out what's a pseudo relapse and what's a true relapse. And one of the things that I think is really important, particularly as we're starting to establish a relationship with a patient, whether they're newly diagnosed by us or they're coming to us for second opinion or whatever, is to help them identify what might be a true relapse and what might be a pseudo relapse. I have people who come to us for a second opinion and I'll ask them about their history and I say, have you had any relapses? Oh yeah, I have two or three a week. Well, I, you know, obviously we've, we've got to tease out some information there and help them understand really what the difference is between a relapse and a, and a symptom. Um, from there, we may or may not choose to add MRI findings. Um, one of the things about looking for a true lap, relapse with an MRI is, uh, yes, we might be looking for GAD-enhancing lesions, but just because they're not there doesn't mean this isn't a new relapse. It, it may be something that just hasn't shown up right away or isn't available for our imaging. So I think the big issue for us in diagnosing is that uh, the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis first and foremost, followed by use of ancillary uh, testing such as MRI if and when we need it. And you know, in that way, recognizing each individual relapse, sort of a microcosm for how we make the diagnosis of MS in the grand scheme, you know, it's still a clinical diagnosis and we use our ancillary testing to fill that out. After a relapse or after the first event, when, when do you feel comfortable saying that this has declared itself as multiple sclerosis, a, 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 a disease disseminated across space and time? Right. So that gets me back to the history of medicine. Because prior to the era of the MRIs and prior to the availability of disease-modifying therapies, uh, there was a general reluctance on the part of neurologists to establish a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis because it was vested with lamentable results. You know, you would tell, as used to be said, you would tell the patient they had multiple sclerosis and they envisioned being wheelchair bound in a short period of time. And there was little that you were capable of doing. So you really didn't make that diagnosis after that first event, even when you really strongly suspected it. And not everybody actually went with those first events went on to develop a second event, which would have been the clue that indeed they had multiple sclerosis. So, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, diagnosis of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, which is what 80 or 85% of the patients are diagnosed with when first diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, was really not codified until the early 1960s when people started looking at drugs to determine whether or not these drugs had any value in the treatment of, real, of, of multiple sclerosis. Then you had to have a disease that was well framed, very well defined, and that led to the Shoemaker criteria, and the Shoemaker criteria uh, evolved into other criteria that ultimately um, became the McDonald criteria. And we now have three iterations of the McDonald criteria, uh, the most recent coming out in 2017. Fundamentally, what you want to see is dissemination in space and dissemination in time. And, and that went to the very earliest definitions, and, and we use various criteria to do that. You could do it on the basis of clinical um, uh, um, features, so the person who has two events, uh, you don't even need an MRI on. Uh, 
but you'd like to see objective abnormalities on the physical examination. That's critical. Uh, otherwise, we, we buttress what we see with uh, paraclinical uh, uh, findings. These include MRI findings where you want to see at least uh, T2 lesions in two of four areas, juxtacortical, periventricular, uh, so on. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have gadolinium enhancing lesions. And we now use uh, spinal fluid, uh, the presence of oligoclonal bands to help us with respect to dissemination in time. So, so there are criteria that are well established that we use. Uh, they have been, as Dr. Lublin has stated, uh, abused and abused. Uh, so you have to be ca careful in their application. Uh, but, but there are criteria that help us establish this diagnosis. And I think you're right. You know, the goal has been to establish it earlier and earlier. And that the tension that's there, as Andy Solomon has written about, is the tension between making an early diagnosis and making a misdiagnosis. A absolutely. So. And in fact, there have been studies that have looked at this. So in the 1980s, uh, the time to establish the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis was actually quite long. And with every succeeding decade, actually every succeeding five-year interval, the, the time from first presentation to the establishment of a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis has shortened. Uh, and there's a value to that because the earlier you treat a person, and this has been repeatedly demonstrated, the earlier you treat a person with a disease-modifying therapy, the better they do. It makes sense. It also draws on what, what Rob, you said earlier, that relapses early on are, are a concerning prognostic feature. Yes. So we try to shut them down. And I think that one of the, you know, one of the major pitfalls if we talk about diagnosing relapsing remitting MS and applying the McDonald or the international panel criteria, the major pitfall is identifying a typical clinically isolated syndrome or CIS, right? So where people trip up is applying the diagnostic criteria to situations where people do not have a syndrome, including physical exam findings, that's typical of uh, uh, inflammatory demyelination. So the, the diagnostic criteria were meant to be applied to people where, just like Amy was talking about, that have symptoms typical of a relapse. And uh, that means that they have a typical optic neuritis or have a typical brainstem syndrome or a typical syndrome for partial myelitis. Something like this where um, uh, you can trace the event back to an inflammatory demyelination uh, event and, uh, and that's the situation where the diagnostic criteria apply. It's not in the person who gets an MRI after having classic migraine headaches and has white spots on the MRI. It's, uh, it's only in those cases where we've already applied what we've talked about today, which is um, identifying this as a typical um, relapse, even though if it's a first one ever, the nomenclature gets confusing and why are we calling it a relapse, but um, it's still right. kind of what we do. Right, it's still a relapse even when it's the first event. Yes. But the, the kind of clinical thinking and parsing out the, the characteristic symptoms of MS relapse are important in distinguishing relapses in people who have known MS, just as it's important in recognizing what constitutes a first diagnosis of multiple sclerosis.